invite you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 7 this morning. Isaiah 7. And our title today is Fear is Sin. As we move throughout the book of Isaiah, we are in a different section now that happens many years after the last chapter we looked at. See, because the last chapter, chapter 6, uh, talked about how in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And in chapter 7, it says, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham. Uh, so we are now two kings after Uzziah. And we're also in a kind of different section of Isaiah because the section we're looking at is going to contain a lot of narrative, right, where it just kind of tells a story rather than gives prophetic oracles or words that the Lord brings to Isaiah that he then communicates to the people. A lot of what we have looked at in Isaiah has been this imagery and of, of, with, with like poetry, right? But here in chapter 7, we have kind of a, a story, a little historical account of something that went on in the life of Israel. And what we're going to see today is God give us an insight into fear and why that can be wrong and how fear can be used incorrectly or correctly. You see, fear is a sin because it gives to something in creation something that should only belong to the Lord. Okay? So fear is sin because we're devoting something to something that is created that belongs only to the Lord. I am to fear Him. Jesus said it this way, don't fear the one that can destroy your body, but fear the one who can destroy your soul in hell. So when I fear, I'm giving my awe, my, my fear, my uh, just respect and uh, even holy terror to someone that doesn't deserve it. God is the one who we are to fear. So I ask you this morning, think about what do you fear? What do I fear? Do we fear uh, bad things happening to our kids? Uh, I remember my mom told me after um, someone got married, one of my brothers, she said, oh, at first I thought, phew, I've got them all married off now. And then she realized, oh, now, now there's a whole new host of things to worry about. You know, I, I now have added to my family, and my family's going to keep multiplying. There's going to be more people to think about. My work isn't done. And thankfully, she couched it in the idea of my work isn't done for prayer, but sometimes we, we might fear what's going to happen to my kids. You know, are they going to be contributing members to society? Or maybe you're looking back and uh, you're, you're older and your kids are older and, you're, and you fear some situation happening to them. Do you fear disease? We have thankfully, I think, come out of a pandemic. <laughs> and uh, did that inspire fear? And what did we fear? Did we fear the disease itself? Did we fear death? Did we fear government regulation? Uh, did we fear loss of freedom? You know, there are a lot of fears going into that. Do we fear political threat? Well, no, we're the United States. We have nothing to fear. We have the biggest military in the world, spend the most of, of it anywhere. You know, but if any of you, like I, live through 9-11, you realize we're not impenetrable. Is there something to fear? Maybe you fear something like taxes, right? Uh, we're a little past that, right? Uh, unless you file an extension, get your taxes done. But hey, you might fear the IRS. Uh, or some of the modern problems we fear, I think because we're in such a free and uh, a society that we have so much wealth, we still find things to fear. We have more than anyone ever in, in, in history, and we have angst and we fear things like not being effective in my job and not making an imprint on the world. Those are things that people who have all their needs met still end up fearing. 
So it doesn't matter who you are, you're probably going to fear. And the Lord gives us assurances of how to get rid of that fear and how to view that fear in light of who God is. And that's what we're going to see today. Uh, so let's move through this passage. We're going to do Isaiah 7, uh, 1 to 17 this morning. So let's first just look at verses 1 and 2. And we will talk about the threat that we see here. Can you advance that slide? All right, the threat, verses 1 to 2. Here's what's going on historically. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Razan, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the field are moved with the wind. So re remember, there's a, there's a lot of names just in these first two verses. Let's try to kind of remind you of what these names are. We're talking about Ahaz, a king who is the son of Jotham, who is the son of Uzziah. Uzziah is that king that died. And Isaiah saw that grand, glorious vision of God in the year that he died. Uzziah was a good king, uh, but at the end of his life thought he would offer sacrifices to God as a priest. And God struck him with leprosy, and because of that, he was not able to meet with people for the rest of his life. So that was Uzziah. Jotham has kind of a small history. We know, uh, you know, you can read Kings and Chronicles to find out more about him. Uh, he had a co-reign with Uzziah, so it's hard to sometimes figure out the dates of the king's reign because some of them overlap. Uh, and then after Jotham is Ahaz, and that's who we're talking about. So Ahaz is the king of Judah. Judah are those two tribes of Israel that are in the south, Judah and Benjamin. They are the tribes that kind of uh, continue on the line of King David. David ruled all 12 tribes at once, but you remember after David was his son Solomon, after Solomon, the, the 10 tribes uh, of the north broke away and went with Jeroboam, and only two southern tribes went with Rehoboam, Solomon's uh, son. Sorry, I'm introducing even more names that aren't in here. But all that to say, we have Razan, uh, who is king of Syria. Syria would be kind of northeast of Israel uh, at this time. So we have Syria, and then uh, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel. He would be the king of these ten northern tribes of Israel. All right? So these would be people who were all uh, of the Hebrew people, the, the ten tribes and the two southern tribes. But what they do is Syria... The northern tribes of Israel come together against the southern tribes of Judah, where Ahaz is king. They went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but they couldn't prevail. So it was told to the house of David. So verse 2, the house of David is Ahaz and his throne. You know, it's called the house of David because he's a descendant of David. Okay, Got it all straight? There will be a test afterwards, but... Ahaz is a descendant of David, so his household is called uh, David. So it was told to Ahaz, you could say, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. Ephraim is one more name to make this all more confusing. Ephraim is the ten tribes of Israel, okay, the northern kingdom. So that's what actually goes in your first blank there. Ephraim equals the northern kingdom of Israel consisting of those ten tribes. Okay, so here's why you can reduce these verses. There's only three major players, okay? There's Syria, Judah, Israel, right? Ahaz is Judah slash house of David. Syria is King Raisin, right? So remember him, he's like the shriveled up guy, uh, California Raisins. Uh, this shows how older you are if you knew that. And then Pekah is the king of Israel, which is also Ephraim. Okay, so there's all these names going, and there's really only three guys here. 
Two of them are coming against Ahaz at the time. All right. So it says that Ahaz and all the people, they're scared because they're in the south and they've got Syria coming down and they've got Israel coming down to attack them. And it was told to the house of David. So his heart, that is Ahaz's heart, and the heart of his people were moved. They're, it says they're shaking as trees of the woods are moved with the wind. Uh, we used to have a big old pine tree in our backyard. And my brothers and I would climb up it really high. And you know you got really high when you could actually feel like the top of it move. That's when my grandmother got really nervous. And uh, that's when my mom also would say, you know, we'd say, oh, the tree was moving. We were so high in it. She'd say, don't tell me those things. I don't want to hear that. Uh, but this tree, you know, trees blow in the wind. But what does that remind you of throughout this book of Isaiah? Shaking like trees, it's a garden theme. Remember, this whole book all the way up until this point, has used the idea of trees and plants over and over and over in every chapter. So in every chapter, I'll point this out to you, where we see this tree theme. It's just Isaiah's motif that he keeps saying over and over, just so that you make connections, right? The connection of, if I'm a vine planted into God and receiving life from him, I will bear great fruit. But if I am a rebellious vine, God will chop me off and throw me away like chaff. And if I'm a rebellious tree, God will chop me down. And God will burn me up. And we're going to see some more burning and chopping later in this chapter. And if you remember in chapter 6, it said uh, that Israel, uh, all of Judah was going to be chopped down like a forest. But out of that would sprout up something. And we'll see this later in chapter 11, that from the stem of Jesse will arise the branch, and that will be the Messiah. So this idea of garden, trees, plants, it's all throughout the beginning of Isaiah here. So Isaiah just continues it. He could have picked any, any image. He could, say, could have said, you know, they were shaken like, I don't know, anything else that shakes. They were shaken like some, uh, uh, you know, a baby rattle. But no, he chose this tree image because it just continues uh, this theme of garden that he has. But I want to look at 2 Kings chapter 16 just to give you a little bit of historical background of uh, Ahaz and all the stuff going on here. Because uh, 2 Kings 16, it gives us a little more information on what it looks like for Ahaz to be afraid and how he chooses to lead his nation in this whole uh, skirmish that we have happening. Second Kings 16 says, In the seventeenth year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, it's the same guy we just read about, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was twenty years old when he became king, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, which would have been the ten northern tribes. Uh, indeed, he made his sons pass through the fire according to the abomination of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel. Do you know what that means? It means he sacrificed babies to the god Molech. Okay. They would put babies on uh, just these burning hot statues and would just sear them and then throw them into the fire to appease the god Molech. And you'll find Ahaz later on in Isaiah not wanting to test out or try the Lord, but yet he was willing to put children into fire to obey a false god. That should be a warning to all of us. Not that, oh, I might go follow some god of Canaan, but that it will cost you dearly to follow things that are not the Lord. And this even gives us an insight into fear. It will cost you deeply to fear other things rather than God. Ahaz feared some god Molech, a god of the Canaanites, who required the death of children. 
more than he feared the loving God of the universe. So this gives us an insight into uh, Ahaz, but it continues, uh, verse where we at here, verse 4, and he sacrificed and burned incense on high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. Whenever it says they worshipped on the hills and under every tree, it means they worshipped everywhere but the one temple that God had told them to worship in. Again, it's people worshiping God the way they want, not the way God has prescribed. When re so verse 5, now here's the historical situation we're in. Then Reason, uh, Reason, rather, the king of Syria and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to make war. Now they're north of Jerusalem, but they go up. Do you remember from our study of the Psalms of Ascent, whenever you go to Jerusalem, what direction do you go? Right? It's like all of you who are older. You used to walk to school what way? Uphill. Both ways. Yes. So you always go up to Jerusalem because it's on a mountain. Uh, so they go up to Jerusalem to make war. They besieged uh, but Ahaz but could not overcome him. So they tried to get rid of him out of Jerusalem. They tried to oust him, but they couldn't do it. At that time, Razan, the king of Syria, captured Eloth for Syria and drove men of Judah from Eloth. Then the Edomites went to Eloth and dwelt there to this day. Uh, Eloth is this important uh, port city on the Red Sea. If you look at a map, the Red Sea like comes down from Egypt and then has like two forks. Eloth would be on this one. Uh, I mean, if I'm looking at the map, flip it around here, this... And it would be like south of Judah, and it was in this important city where you, there was copper mined there, and they traded. Uh, you know, it's always, big cities are always built on water because that allows for trade and commerce. Uh, so they capture this city. So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria. Now just to get this straight, this is actually Tiglath-Pileser III. It's not the first one. I know you're all wondering that. Like, which Tiglath Pileser is this, right? Uh, t the first Tiglath Pileser is like 1000 BC. Uh, now we're in to like the 720s. Um, but Tiglath Pileser III, we used to call him TP3 in our history, uh, Bible history class. But so Ahaz sent messengers to the king of Assyria, this TP3 guy, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and save me from the hand of the king of Assyria and from the king of Israel who rise against me. Look at verse 8. Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house, and he sent it to the present, uh, sent it as a present to the king of Assyria. There's another confusing thing. Assyria and Syria are two different things, right? Not like possum and opossum. Uh, it's two different things. The king of Assyria, Assyria is like this b empire uh, that was like near Babylon and it ruled much of the ancient Near Eastern world at this time. Tiglath Pileser III was this mighty conqueror. We've got pictures of him fighting lions. Boy, he just thought he was something. So Ahaz is like, I'm going to join up with the guy who I think is the winner. I'm going to trust him. And look how much he trusts him. He says, I'm your son. He's using family language, saying, you're a father to me, meaning help me, Tiglath, Pileser. And not only does he do that, what does he do to pay him off? He takes articles from the temple of the Lord. That's how much he fears this raisin and pika guy. He's willing to go to this foreign power, call him a father, and use articles that should be used for worshiping the Lord and use them to worship, in a sense, this king. This shows us something when it comes to fear. The presence of a threat gives us an opportunity to place our fear in the correct place. That's what we find here. Whoops. We find that this fear gives Ahaz an opportunity. Are you going to trust God or are you going to trust man? He chooses man. We must all make the same decision when we're afraid of something. 
am I going to choose the man-made way out of this, or am I going to choose God's way? Now, that doesn't mean God can't use human means. And in fact, he will. He's just not going to use the great Tiglath-Pileser III. He's going to use a baby. That's how he's going to conquer the world. A baby who doesn't rise up and become a military leader. A baby who dies for the nation. A baby who dies as a criminal. But I'm getting ahead of myself, right? I don't want to give spoilers yet. So let's just keep going through the passage. Uh, so the heart of the people are moved. They're terrified. Let's now go to the solution uh, to the threat, verses 3 to 9. So then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you, and Shear Jashub, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted. For those two stubs of smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Razan and Syria and the son of Remaliah, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have plotted evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it. Let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves and set a king over them, the son of Tabil. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Razan. Within sixty-five years Ephraim will be broken, so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. God won't even mention his name. He'll just mention his dad to kind of throw shade at him, to say, hey, I'm not even going to mention you. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. So the Lord tells Isaiah to go meet Ahaz. He says, you and take your son Shear Jashub. Uh, there's a name if you folks are looking for baby names. Chapter 8 will have an even better one uh, once we get to Maher Halal Shashbaz. But um, here in chapter 7, we got Shir Jashub, Isaiah's son. And the neat thing about this name is it means a remnant shall be returned. Okay? Uh, Shir means remnant. Jashub comes from the verb Yashuv, meaning to return. It can mean return or repent. It's a word we talk about with the exile. Israel was turned away from God, but then they turned back to him. Uh, it's the key word in the book of Ruth when Naomi says, Don't call me bitter, or don't call me Naomi, call me bitter. The Lord's made my life bitter, Mara. But then God turns her and turns Ruth uh, to him. And so. His son is there because his name means a remnant shall return. Why is that significant? Because in chapter 6, Isaiah has just preached and said, this whole land is going to be decimated. Remember, it'll be, it'll be destroyed to a tenth of what's left. That's all that's going to be left. I'm going to so come through there and so clean you out. So Isaiah brings along his son, and his son's name is a promise that you'll be able to return. So what this is gearing us up for is Isaiah has a son who's providing, whose name provides hope for Israel. This is kind of God's way of prepping them for the message that's about to come about a son whose name will mean hope for Israel. Okay, See how that works? Uh, so Shir Jashub comes with Isaiah. Now they meet Ahaz in the aqueduct by the fuller's by the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. Why is Ahaz in this location? Because here's what Ahaz is facing. He's facing Razan and Pekah coming to Jerusalem. And the way you would attack a city is lay siege to it. Now, how do you lay siege to a city? You cut off its food supply and its water supply. So Ahaz is examining his water supply. You know, he's probably bringing troops there, quartering them, and, and, and just trying to shore up their ability to have water so that Raisin and Pika can't kind of choke him out of his city. 
because that's what you would do to take over a city at that time. So Isaiah meets Ahaz where he is as Ahaz is preparing to uh, face this, uh, th these two fighting armies coming against him. Now I love how the Lord describes them. They're two smoking firebrands. So they think they're these strong flames just devouring everything. And Isaiah says, no, they're just two little wicks about to be put out. It's camping season right now, right? And fire times, and you might set up your fire, and you know, you might sometimes be as useful as I am at times where you got the fire going, and then all of a sudden you get the smoke because it goes out, right? And yeah, there's a little heat there, but not even enough to melt your marshmallow. So God says that's what's going on. They're two smoking firebrands. There's no devouring fire. Uh, they were all, it's like when you pour kerosene on it. Poof, it. It looks great for a few seconds, then that burns off and you've got nothing left. And it's still not lit up. But again, the idea of smoking firebrands, what is that but another garden theme, right? So this is, once again, God using this idea of we're all plants, and some of these plants are going to be lopped off and thrown into the fire pit. And these plants of, uh, you, you know, pica and uh, raisin are like these sticks that thought they're big and mighty and they're burning against you. And God just is like, yeah, uh, throw it to the side, cast it aside. It doesn't even burn up or devour anything. So God says, that's all they are. Don't worry about them. God is trying to show Ahaz he does not need to fear. But it, it, it uh, continues there, these two smoking firebrands, that's their fierce anger. Because Syria and Ephraim, the son of Remaliah, have plotted evil against you, uh, verse 6, saying, let us go up to Judah and trouble it, let us make a gap in the wall for ourselves. That's when you siege the city, right? You battering ram, you make a hole in the wall. And we'll set up a king over them, the son of Tabeel. Uh, so we don't know much about this guy, but what they're saying is, we're going to set up a king uh, who will not be pro-Assyria. They, they want to set up a king who is against Assyria because uh, all these guys are trying to fight against Assyria. Syria, Israel, they don't want to bow down to this king, Tiglath-Pileser III. Uh, so what they're doing is they're trying to uh, set up a king who's going to um, not... Uh, go along with that plan of Tiglath-Pileser III. Uh, but one thing I forgot to point out to you here, verse 4, I want to focus on this. What did God say for Isaiah to say to Ahaz? He said to him, Take heed, be quiet, do not fear or be faint-hearted for these two stubs of smoking firebrands. So God gives him three commands here. Take heed, that just means Pay attention to my words. This is the word sometimes translated, behold. When God says this, it means listen to my words. Not listen to everything around you. Listen to my word. That's what we need to do when we're in fear. Behold. Listen to the word of God. Stop listening to the clamoring of the world that is bringing you this fear. And be quiet. Be quiet. When we listen to God's word, we need to quiet ourselves. We need to be listening to what he says and not listening to everything the world says and then just trying to plot and figure everything out. I know a few weeks ago, for instance, when we were looking for a vehicle, uh, I know my mind just got so unquiet. Uh, it, it, because with the internet now, there are just hundreds of opportunities for cars, and I just... I would start seeing cars in my sleep because I'd spend so much time on Facebook Marketplace looking for cars, and I looked at people's cars and I'm like, okay, does that have a third row of seating? Because I got too many kids, so I need third, three rows of seating. So I kept looking at cars with third rows of seating and asking people and talking, and like, it was anything but quiet because I was just trying to do everything I could to get the car. And, and sometimes that's what we do in situations. We just think about every outcome and every possible, possible thing we could do and our response and what someone else's response will be. And we try to anticipate every move like we're playing chess and think 20 moves ahead. And sometimes God says to us, be quiet. 
who definitely says, take heed or behold, listen to my word, stop listening to your own mind going on and on and on, stop listening to the world around you, listen to me. So when there is a situation to fear, we must work at quieting ourselves so that we can observe. You have to work on that. That's the spiritual discipline you need to be able to quiet yourselves. So God assures, and here's the word God gives to him. Don't even listen. Don't worry about these two little smoking firebrands. But Ahaz would not quiet himself and listen to how much God was going to conquer them. Because he says in verse 8, the head of Syria is Damascus. The head of Damascus is raisin. Within 65 years, Ephraim, which is, remember, Israel, 10 northern tribes, Ephraim will be broken. So he's saying in 65 years, this nation isn't even going to exist. And you know, that's exactly what happened. 65 years after this prophecy, you have Esarhaddon, uh, who was another king of Assyria. He went into this region and took over Samaria. And he brought in a lot of foreigners and just intermarried the people so that they didn't really even exist as a nation anymore. So what God said would happen, happened. There was nothing to fear because God's promises came true. Now the trouble for us, we don't have Isaiah here promising this is exactly what's going to happen, right? When I was looking for a new car, I didn't have Isaiah come up to me and say, Behold! You will get a 2012 Kia Sedona with 46,000 miles for this much money. God didn't do that. But God did give promises in his word. And what did I need to do? Quiet myself and listen to those promises. I needed to pray and seek the Lord and listen to him. And God will show you through his word and through circumstances what his will is. But we have to be willing to quiet ourselves and listen. Uh, so Isaiah continues, the head of Ephraim is Samaria, the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. All this means is, what God is saying is, don't be afraid of these nations, because these nations are from the heads, the kings, and these kings are just two wimpy people that are people, creatures that I have made. They're people. The head of your nation is me, the Lord of all creation. The head of their nations are these two smoking firebrands. That's why he says this. And then the last thing God says in this oracle, verse 9, If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Uh, so this word believe and word established come from the same root word. And that word in Hebrew is where we get our word, Amen. When we say amen, what does that mean? It means what you have just said, may it be true. What you have just said, we agree, we believe. This is, this is the word of the Lord. Okay? So here's kind of what it sounds like in the Hebrew. If you will not uh, believe, you will not be someone who is to be believed in. You will not be trustworthy. You will not be amen. Right? You will not be established. So God kind of gives this pun on amen so that they understand. Believe and you will be someone that can be believed on, meaning you will be established. You will not be like a tree shaking in the wind. You will be established. So what God calls us to believe is that he can deliver us. But if we refuse to believe that he can deliver us, we will be more vulnerable to attack. We'll be more vulnerable to attack if we won't believe that God can deliver. If you will not quiet your mind, you will be more prone to the attacks of the enemy, to the attacks of life. The more you hold on to your anxiety and don't give it to the Lord, the more that anxiety will rule over you. You have to give it to the Lord. So now... Isaiah gives to Ahaz a sign of deliverance. And this sign of deliverance that we find in verses 10 to 17, we usually preach on this at Christmas time. 
It says, moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz. This might be a later time. We don't even know. Here's what the Lord said. Ask a sign for yourself. God knew Ahaz was fearful and said, I'll give you a sign. He remembers like Gideon who would lay out a fleece and ask a sign to the Lord. Now, many men throughout God's word asked for a sign. They asked for a sign at the time of Jesus, but Jesus wouldn't give them one. Why? Because he'd already given them tons. That's what all the miracles were. And they just keep asking for more signs. Well, God, in his grace and his gentleness, takes this wicked king who throws babies in a fire but won't trust him. God takes this king and says, ask a sign. I'll do anything. And look at how it describes it. Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth, uh, which is the word sheol, the grave where the dead live, or ask it in the height above, in heaven. So God is saying you could ask for anything. We'll find later on in the book, Hezekiah asks for a sign that the sun go back, and God gives him that sign, and God would have done it for Ahaz too. You know, our God promises in Ephesians that he can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think. I go to that verse when I pray because I realize my imagination is so small at what I think God can do. And he's saying I can do way beyond anything you could even imagine. So he asks Ahaz, ask for this sign. In verse 12, but Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Ahaz has this false piety. Perhaps he's uh, trying to bring out Deuteronomy, which says, You shall not test the Lord with a sign. But the Lord had asked him to seek a sign. So he's not trying to put the Lord to the test. The Lord is giving him the opportunity to do it. So Ahaz has false piety. I won't ask the Lord. Well, why won't he? Because we've seen the heart of Ahaz from 2 Kings. Ahaz is someone who wants to trust in Assyria, he wants to trust in the god Molech, and he wants to trust that his only way of deliverance is to not have Raisin and Pekah come against him. That's all Ahaz wants to do. He's got it all figured out. He has the plan. He doesn't want to go with God's plan. So, although he sounds good, he's not. Right? So... Uh, verse 13, then he said, Hear now, O house of David, God is talking. Is it a small thing for you to weary men, but you will weary my God also? So Isaiah says, look, nobody likes you, <laughs> right? You, you, you make it men angry, now you're making God angry. You're tiring everyone out. You, you got Raisin and Pika mad at you, and now you've got God is wearied with the way you are acting. So, because of that, verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, that same word is take heed. Behold, pay attention, listen to the word of the Lord. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey he shall eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose to the good. For if before the child shall know how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house, days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. So God says, Behold, I'll have this virgin conceive. Before that child grows up, that is in a very short time, your two enemies are going to be destroyed, but then the one you thought was going to be your friend, the king of Assyria, he's going to come in and take you over. And it's going to be worse than when the kingdom split up. So stop trusting in that stinking Assyrian king. It's basically a tone of what's going on here. I will bring days that have not come upon you since the days uh, that have uh, happened since Ephraim departed from Assyria. So what we find when it comes to fear is sometimes we have the stubborn desire to hold on to our fear. So God provides Ahaz with a sign, even though Ahaz doesn't even want it. God says, I'm going to have a virgin conceive. That's a miracle, right? That does not happen. This virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. 
What does Emmanuel mean? Well, Matthew tells us. Imano means with us. El is God. So Imano means God with us. So we'll call his name Emmanuel because God is with us in this fight. And a baby uh, eating curds and honey that he may know to refuse the evil and choose to good. But before he even knows how to do that, the land will be forsaken by her kings. Uh, and what we would find is that TP3, the king of Assyria, would invade Israel uh, about two years after this prophecy was given. So in the time that it takes for a child to develop a sense of what is good and evil, the king of Assyria will take over your enemies. That's what goes on. And I might say, well, what are curds and honey? Why is the child eating this? Uh, there's debate about that, but most of the time the idea of curds and honey is the good stuff, the fat of the land. Honey is not necessary for everyday life. It's a sweet. It's something special. Curds, that is cheese. That's, you have so much milk, you're not consuming it. It sits around and becomes cheese. You make cheese out of it because you have an overflowing abundance of, probably at this time, camel's milk. So curds and honey is usually the uh, meal of the rich. And you find when Israel was to go into the land of Israel, what was that called? The land flowing with milk and honey, okay? Curds would be you've got so much milk, you're making cheese out of it. We used to have goats, and we would milk them, and we uh, would drink so much, but then we had so much left over, we'd make cheese, we'd make milk, we'd make everything, because we had way too much. And then finally, we were so sick of all the goat milk, we got rid of goats. So... And I have not gone back since, and I'm very thankful for that. But that's what curds and honey is about in this passage. But the whole focus of this is that the sign that they should not be afraid is that a virgin would conceive. Now this sign, little did they know, wouldn't come for 700 years. Now the prophecy assured them that these enemies would be taken care of immediately. But the idea that God was with Israel and that they had nothing to fear and that the son of David would rule on the throne forever, that child Emmanuel, that wouldn't come miraculously until 700 years later when it tells us in Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 to 23, uh, that Jesus fulfills this prophecy, that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, and that he fulfilled this prophecy because he was God with us. So when the house of David, that would be the leadership of Judah, sees a pregnant young maiden, a virgin who has not had a baby, the house of David would know God is now here. We are going to be delivered forever. This is pointing to Jesus Christ. It's fulfilled in no one else but him. So this shows us fears can be overcome because Jesus Christ, who is with us, conquers death, which is the ultimate power in this life. This is the same message I preached at Easter. The resurrection is our hope because it conquers the best thing man has over us. The, the strongest penalty man can impose on us is the penalty of the sword, the penalty of taking my life. But if that power is taken away, if there's life after death, what do you and I have to fear? Nothing. Because at worst, the worst thing that can happen is actually the best thing for me as an individual. Now that doesn't mean I'm not terrified for my family's sake if the Lord were to take me away, if I were to die in war or something. But the power that death has loses its grip because of Jesus Christ, who was God, with us. God coming into this mess of the earth, living and experiencing all the ills of humanity, and even having the worst thing happen, dying. God experienced that, and Jesus Christ died in our place. And if we would believe that, we will have the same fate as he did. We will rise from the dead. Because Jesus Christ is God with us. That's what the resurrection of Jesus is all about. It casts out fear. So the next time you have fear in your life, quiet yourself. Stop listening to that fear. Stop listening to the enemy. Start listening to the prophecy of Emmanuel. 
Jesus is with you. He said he would never leave nor forsake you. May you trust that today. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you that you cast out fear because of your Son, because of the presence of you with humanity. Lord, I thank you that your Son became man and has experienced what we have, yet without sin. I thank you he lived a perfect life. I thank you that he rose again. And I thank you that that is the fate that awaits those who trust in you and believe that gospel good news message. In Jesus' name I pray.